Let's, uh, let's pray, because uh, that, that just leads us to the throne of grace, and let's do so. So God, you are worthy. We can't say it or proclaim it enough or more loudly or more skillfully, because you are worthy. And so may you be found worthy in the text this morning and by vessels of clay proclaim how great you are. So be with us now. Be with us in this time and in this text. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So I'm uh, Pastor Nate Thompson. I'm one of the pastors here at Southside Bible Church, and I do want to welcome you if you're a guest here, and I welcome the choir with us this morning. Thank you for blessing us. So I'll open with this. A uh, young Cole, a boy scout of a bygone era, wrote the following to his parents. Dear Mom and Dad, our scoutmaster told us all to write to our parents in case you saw the flood on TV and worried. We are okay. Only one of our tents and two of our sleeping bags got washed away. Luckily, none of us got drowned because we were all up on the mountain looking for Chad when it happened. (laughs) Oh yes, uh, please call Chad's mom and tell her he's okay. He can't write because of the cast. I got to ride in one of those search and rescue jeeps. It was neat. We never would have found him in the dark if it hadn't been for the lightning. (laughs) Scoutmaster Long got mad at Chad for going on a hike alone without telling anyone. Chad said he did tell him, but it was during the fire. So he probably didn't hear him. Don't worry, it didn't hurt anything very much. It just burned part of the chow hall. Scout Master Long said, we will have to wash the black stuff off the meat that used to be in the cooler. But he said it'd be okay. Do you know if, if you put gas on a fire, the canister will blow up? <laughs> the wet wood still didn't burn, but one of our tents did. Also some of our clothes. John's going to look weird until his hair grows back. We will come home on Saturday if Scoutmaster Long gets the car fixed. It wasn't his fault about the wreck. The brakes worked okay when we left. (laughs) Scoutmaster Long said it was, the car was old and you expect some things like that to break down. That's probably why he can't get insurance on it. (laughs) We think it's a neat car. He didn't care if we get it dirty and it's hot sometimes. He lets us ride out on the tailgate. It gets pretty hot with 10 people in the car. He let us take turns riding in the trailer and the, until the highway patrolman stopped and talked to us. So Scott Master Long's a neat guy, don't worry. He's a good driver, especially when the wheel came off. Uh, when we were going around those steep curbs. In fact, he's teaching Terry how to drive. He only lets him drive on those mountain roads where there isn't any traffic. All we see is those big logging trucks. I'm glad Terry wasn't driving when the wheel came off. We probably would have gone off the cliff. So guess what? We passed all of our first aid merit badges. When Dave dove into the lake and cut his arm, we all got to see how a tourniquet works. Also, Wade and I threw up. Scoutmaster Long said it was probably just food poisoning from the leftover chicken. He said they got sick that way sometimes from the food they ate in the prison. I have to go now. We're going to town to mail our letters and buy bullets. (laughs) The reason we have to buy more bullets is Jimmy threw all the other ones in the fire. (laughs) It it sure was a loud noise. It was neat, though. It sounded like a bunch of bees flying out of the fire. Oh, don't worry. We put duct tape over the holes in the tents. (laughs) Don't worry about anything. We're fine. Love, Cole. P.S. How long has it been since I've had my tetanus shot? (laughs) So from young Cole's perspective, all is right with the world because he praises and trusts in his scoutmaster. Now from our perspective, his scoutmaster isn't worthy of praise or trustworthiness. (laughs) 
So, uh, but this morning, we're going to look at God. And God is worthy of praise and worthy of our trust and worthy of so much more. So with those thoughts in mind, would you turn in your Bibles to the 33rd Psalm? That's where we're going to find ourselves this morning. And as you're turning there, allow me to make a personal connection to this text. Um, I didn't choose this text so much as it chose me. So I've been a, a pastor at this church for about nine years. And I can honestly say 2020 and 2021 were, were the hardest years in ministry I think I've ever faced. And I've been a Christian um, a while. And out of that, I found myself physically exhausted, emotionally exhausted, and spiritually exhausted. And I found myself sharing with the elders that I was so. And yes, a break would have helped to get some rest physically, but what bothered me was just a physical break isn't where you find spiritual refreshment. And I needed to figure that out before I took any kind of vacation or break or sabbatical or anything of that nature. I knew I needed to figure this out. And so uh, it was by God's grace that we were going through as an elder board a book. Um, it was a dangerous calling by Paul David Tripp. And I wish I could share with you all the thoughts that came out of it. But one of them that, that really shook me was this, this phrase, you're in awe of God amnesiac. And that stuck with me. So we're going to talk about it more in our text. But this thought, though, drew me into the Psalms. And, and through texting back and forth with a couple in uh, Michigan, we were, we were sharing the Psalms back and forth, back and forth, to, to encourage one another by Psalms, hymns, spiritual Psalms. So we were doing that. And uh, I stumbled across Psalm 33. And what drew me in was verse 8. And that's going to be part of our text this morning that we're going to uh, look at. But it was the psalm as a whole that then began to capture my attention. And as I read it more and more and more and more, I found my soul, my spirit refreshed in the Lord. And so what I'm hoping this morning is that I can do the same and to just share from the overflow of my heart and experience with you some of what has really captured me. And it was so appropriate, the things that we were singing this morning that we got to hear from the choir didn't plan that. That was God's doing. And so um, let's go ahead and step into this text. And uh, we're going to have a really simple outline this morning. It's going to be four points because there's four stanzas in this psalm. And we're, and, and we're not going to be able to cover everything in the psalm this morning. Um, I'm just going to share with you some of the key thoughts in each of these stanzas that really spoke to my heart. Um, and, that, and so I'm going to encourage you to get together with your, your community groups this week and discuss this further. So here's the outline. First, um, we're just going to summarize the uh, verses 1 through 5 as praise. Praise. Okay? And then second, verses 6 through 12, awe. Awe. And then third... Verses 13 to 17, strength, strength. And then last, verses 18 through 22, we'll summarize in the word trust, trust. Okay, so let's turn our attention to verses 1 through 5. It says, and I'm reading from the NASB 95, so if yours reads a little bit different, that's fine. Uh, we're going to find some similarities in the way these are structured. It says, sing for joy in the Lord. O oh, you righteous ones, praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Sing praise to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. So we get this. We get um, a, a called group of people, the righteous, to do something, to praise, and then to someone and from someone in the Lord. 
So in, in Hebrew, it starts out like this. In the Lord, you righteous ones, rejoice. You righteous ones, rejoice. And this is Yahweh God, the Lord, that they're speaking of. And so, so look at this. Sing for joy. Well, I don't feel like it because my circumstances are hard or because I've got a boot on my foot or because I am handicapped or because fill in the blank. And yet there's a call. And, and the qualification for this is not our circumstances, but who we're called as. It says, you righteous ones. You righteous ones. In Romans 3.36, Jesus, because of Jesus Christ, we are declared righteous. We're declared righteous. And we praise and thank God for that. And then in His Holy Spirit that resides in believers, we rejoice even in trial, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And then finally, all praise, where does it terminate? Where does it stop? Where does it point to? It's God the Father and Christ our Savior, Ephesians 1, 12 through 1, 11 and 12. So we praise God, not because of what is going on in our lives, but because of who we are and ultimately because of who He is. So notice also that it says in the second part of verse 1, it is uh, fitting. Praise is becoming of the upright. It's fitting, right? Ladies, ever tried on that outfit, that skirt, that dress, that whatever, and it was like, this is it. It's, just, it's, it's fitting. It's so appropriate. It's so, so on. Guys, right? A forklift lifting a crate of forks, Amen. right? Just so appropriate, so appropriate, so right on, so spot on. So, so notice again, why it's so appropriate is, is who we're called as in Christ. That's why it's so appropriate. It's not fitting to be a sourpuss or to be a gnarly dude, right, Ken? Or to be a gnarly dude. It's not fitting for us to go around as grumps. It's fitting for us to ooze praise because of who, who we are, because of what Christ has done, and unto him, and unto him. And so verses 2 and 3 talks about skill and freshness. It's, and it's, you might, might say, I can't sing like that. And I, I get it. I don't sing like that either. But, but it doesn't say, because you sing, well sing. It says, because you're righteous, sing. Because you've been declared righteous by the God of the universe, sing with joy. It's fitting. It's appropriate. It's fine if you're out of tune. You'll be in tune in heaven. <laughs> Praise him and, and do it truly from your heart skillfully. And then we get our first four. There's three fours. Um, our first four is here in this first stanza, in our stanza of, of praise. It says four... And then we get five things, five things. First, God's word is right and true. Second, what God says he will do, he does, and therefore he is faithful. He's faithful. Third and fourth, he loves righteousness and he loves justice. And then lastly, far from least, his loving kindness, his loving kindness is shown throughout the entire world. Just look out the window. If Christ is in your heart, if he has called you as a righteous one, that out there should lead you to praise. Should lead you to praise. It should lead our hearts to praise. Who is this God? And so we praise him. So let's praise him because it's appropriate. It's appropriate for us to praise him. He is praise worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. So let's look at our second stanza. This is what first drew me into this passage, verses 6 through 12. Awe, awe. It says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deeps 
in a storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. And that's what grabbed me. You notice the description. He's describing the creation of the world and He did it in a breath. That's God. And then he describes gathering the waters in a heap. Description of Exodus 14 and 15 when he parted the Red Seas. And, And if that has just become commonplace to you, you haven't thought much on it. It wasn't ankle deep water. It was probably a mile. And as those people walked through and saw from dry land, walls of water held back by the power of God. How amazing. And he takes the deeps of the water and it's it's just like a storage to him. He easily holds it back. And so the call is fear Him, reverence Him. And we should awe, we should awe this God. And so one of the things I noticed as I studied this psalm over and over was God has a habit of taking little guys like you and I and pulling us aside to wake us up. And the first thing that He does is He says, Let me introduce you to creation. A little thing that I did. Look at Job 38. Look at Job 38, verses 1 through 7. And the way he interacts with Job, who at this point is very self-righteous, calling God to answer for what he has done. And God, God answers him, Job 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man. I will ask you and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measure since you know Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. And he continues. He continues. And by Job 40, we get this. Then the Lord said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer. And then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I've spoken, I will not answer, even twice. I'll not add anything more. It shut him up. As God just declares himself, creator of the ends of the earth. And God doesn't let up, by the way. He keeps going. Look at Isaiah 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Look at verse 12. Look at what we see here with respect to creation. Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? and marked off the heavens by the span, not that much, and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure, and weighed the mountains in a balance, and the hills in a pair of scales. Jump down to verse 28. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth does not become weary or tired. 
His understanding is inscrutable. So he takes us by the hand and he says, I want you to think about creation. And I want you to think about what I've done. And I want you to consider. I want you to consider. And where does it bring us? It should bring us to awe. It's what it should do. So remember, remember how I mentioned um, I'd become an awe of God amnesiac. A person with amnesia is a person that's just kind of forgot something. So this is what drew me in. So right here in black and white, we're called to awe in God. Look who he is. He is God. It's so easy to forget who he is. And my problems become this big. And my God becomes this big. And if I put God in his proper place, he puts me in my proper one. And suddenly my God is so big, I can't even stretch out my arms to show. My problems become so small. And he is so able. And he is so worthy. And it brings me to my knees. And it causes me to do what Job did in Job 42, 2 through 6. Where he says, I repent, I repent in dust and ashes. So I repent of being in awe of God, amnesiac. I repent of forgetting just who this God is and how awesome he is. And I stand in awe of him. And it refreshes the soul. It so spiritually feeds to know I am cratered in the hands of Almighty God. Almighty God. So I stand in awe of Him. Verses 9 through 3 of this stanza here in 33 just expound upon this idea of awe, for He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. The Lord nullifies the counsel of the nations, He frustrates the plans of people. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart from generation to generation. You can't thwart God. Blessed is the nation whose God is Yahweh, the Lord. The people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. We can rest in this awesome awe of God. So let us praise him out of the awe of who he is and not let it become commonplace as we walk out into this beautiful world under a big blue sky from which he sends rains and snows and all kinds of wonderful things and flowers grow and animals praise. Ah. Isn't he an awesome God? Don't, don't do what I did and become an awe of God, amnesiac. Don't lose who this is. Don't lose who he is. He's amazing. He's amazing. So that leads us into our third stanza, and our third point where we're going to emphasize strength. Verses 13 to 17. Strength. It says, The Lord looks from heaven and sees the sons of men. From his dwelling place, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. So he's, it's, it's as if it's just right in front of us. It's the picture of you and I standing over an anthill. With full view, you can see them. They're, they're little things. He who fashions the hearts of them all. He's in control, complete control, all the way down to the heart. It's what we've been going over in Romans 9. He's in complete control. Does he understand? Yeah. He who understands all their works. He's, he's not confused. Right? You ever have those days where you're like, what's, what's going on? 
what is going on at work or, or school or whatever it is that you're facing that day? What's going on? For God, it's, it's not. Not for him. And look at this, verses 16 and 17, look at this. The king is not saved by a mighty army. A warrior is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a false hope for victory, nor does it deliver anyone by its great strength. So over and over again, we get this repeat of this, of this idea or thought of strength. And, but the emphasis is, um, this isn't strong. This isn't strong. This isn't strong. And, and we could say or reflect, um, well, we have greater tools of war now. We, we have nuclear power. We have lasers. We have great capabilities. We have great strength. Then you've missed the point. He's saying all, all this is, is nothing. Strength, the strength of man is nothing. It's drawing us and calling us to look to the strength of God. This awesome God who created the ends of the earth, who calls nations but a drop. It's calling us to his strength. And it's so easy for us to get lost in our world and think that we are strong. That we are strong. So, so what is it that we rely on? Do we lie, rely on our own strength in, in our looks, in our, in our success? in our wealth, in, in our abilities, in our cognitive prowess, in our ministry, even? Or, or on our own even physical strength. I don't know about you, but I, I bench press around uh, 245, 250, at 3 o'clock, whatever time I can get into the gym. <laughs> So, I don't count on, yeah, boo. When your main pastor boos you, you've got a problem. I don't count on my physical strength. I don't have very much of it, um, as I'm, particularly as I'm getting older. So, hear me on this. Hear me on this. The church is so blessed to have weakness in it. There are those of you who are probably listening to this message on your backs in bed because you're sick. Or you've got COVID long haulers. Or you're in a wheelchair. Or you're blind. Or you're deaf. or you have some other physical ailment, some weakness. And the world looks at this, and it mocks it, because we need strength, and we do. But you and I offer none of it. Only God does. Only God offers strength. So Ken Murphy comes into the elder meeting at this one point and shares with the elders. He just says, guys, I'm broken. I'm broken. I've got COVID long haulers. I have trouble keeping my thoughts. And he says, maybe you need another pastor. Maybe you need someone else to be in the pulpit. And Psalm 33 says, no. Amen. Amen. It says no because a weak pastor doesn't put us in the delusional world that we can offer anything, that we bring anything to the table. We bring nothing. And I hope it preaches to all of us Weakness is good. Weakness is good. 
Because then we're forced into the reality, into the reality that God is our only strength. So no, the horse doesn't save. Military might doesn't save. Only God does. Let us glory in our weakness. As Paul has said in 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 9, God says, my power is made perfect in your weakness. And I want it to sit in on you. I want it to sit on your hearts. That God's power is completed in our weakness because all of us gets out of the way. And and His power gets to show an all-sufficient, all-powerful God gets put on display. And He gets all of the praise do him, for he is worthy of it. So let us praise our God, for he is awesome and strong, for in my weakness his strength is shown. Praise God. So that leads us to the last stanza, our as, uh, as aeronautical terms would say, our final approach. So behold, so this is trust. Trust is our last point, verses 18 through 22. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope for His loving kindness, to deliver their soul from death, and to keep them alive in famine. So notice that those of us who fear God and and hope in Him aren't disappointed. Look at verse 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. And uh, this phrase, um, waiting... Our soul waiting in the Lord. It's a phrase used all throughout the Old Testament. Um, you can find it in uh, passages like Psalm 27, 14. Um, Psalm 37, 34. Psalm 130, verses 5 through 6. Psalm 147, verse 11. Isaiah 40, 31. Lamentations 3, 25 to 26. Micah 7.7, 7, Jude one twenty one, and that's just a smattering. That's just a small smattering of waiting on the Lord. So this isn't just exclusively here. And this also isn't the waiting that you and I engage in at the DMV, where you've got screaming uh, children, upset uh, people and employees, and... You wait interminably to get to the front of the line only to find out what you've missed and get to repeat it again next day. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) So this isn't that. It's more of the Isaiah 30, 18, where the same Hebrew word is translated as longing. So it's, it's great anticipation with anxious thought of of joy to come. This is me on my wedding day. My wife and I were engaged for 11 months. I know, right? (laughs) And uh, we spent most of our time apart. She was in New York. I was in Louisiana because she was in the smart people school in (laughs) Cornell and I was in the dum-dum school at Louisiana State University. (laughs) And so I'm blessed. So on our wedding day, um, I was waiting for her to come down the aisle, this beautiful 
sweet, loving, wonderful woman that I was going to get to spend the rest of my life with. And so I couldn't wait, although I sat there and wait in this hopeful anticipation of the joys to come in spending my life with her. That's the kind of waiting that we do for the Lord. We don't wait begrudgingly. We don't wait and go, when's he going to be here? When's he going to save me? When's he going to get me out of this? It's quite the opposite. Oh, I can't wait to see what he's going to do. I can't wait to see how he's going to put himself on display. I can't wait to see how he's going to get me out of this jam. Because he's so good. So we wait on the Lord. And he is our help and our shield. And then look at verse 21. Because our heart rejoices in him, for our heart rejoices in him. This is the uh, final four. Bad basketball joke. Okay. Yeah, hey. I try. I'm very trying at times. That's what my wife says. So, for our heart rejoices, for our heart rejoices in Him. So we get a reason, a purpose. For our heart rejoices in Him because we trust in His holy name. That's why we can rejoice. Because we trust in Him. You put yourself, we put ourselves in complete trust of a God who's the creator of the ends of the earth, by the way, whose power is limitless and whose other attributes we don't even have time to mention. We can trust him. And we're so blessed to be able to trust this God. So this last verse, um, I don't necessarily like the way it's structured in the NASB. It says, let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Now, I don't think the interpreters intended the way that kind of reads. It seems to indicate that um, as we hope, um, let your loving kindness be on us to that degree, which is not really the correct thought. Here's more of a um, translation of what it is in Hebrew. It says, um, this is more literal, upon us, O Lord, your loving kindness be in you. We hope accordingly. Okay, And that's more the thought. It's, it's the other way around. It's to the, the degree of God's loving kindness. Let us hope to that. To that degree. Because if, if the other was the reverse, there would be very little hope if the hope was found in us. The hope is found in Him. The hope is found in His loving kindness. Remember, He is faithful and true, and on his word I can rely. So what a blessing it is to be able to hope in a God that is hopeful. It's not a hope, gee, I hope the Broncos do better. It's it's a sure hope. It's this hope. It's a hope in his loving kindness that will be there and has been there from generation to generation to generation. He's a God of great loving kindness. So we've stacked this. Look, we are called to praise in God. In his awesomeness and in his strength and in whom we know we can trust because he shows himself to be trustworthy. Trust him. And look, I would be remiss if I didn't say this. If you don't know him, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. This awesome, all-powerful God, if you don't know him, You're at odds with this awesome God. He is not your friend. He is your enemy. And I hope that wakes you up. That's a terrifying place to be. And it is a terrifying place to be. 
But friends, there's a remedy. There's a remedy in Jesus Christ who went to a cross and took upon himself our sins so that we can be right with the God of the universe. And not only that, to be called his sons and daughters, to be blessed with an inheritance that we can't even begin to imagine. And all of this through Jesus Christ. So if you find yourself today without him, come to him this morning. Come to him by faith. Come to him through Jesus Christ. And you'll find a God very trustworthy, worthy of all of your trust, worthy of all of your praise, worthy of your life, breath, everything that you have to offer for as long as you live, he is worthy. You will find your everything in him as you probably stretched and grasped and reached to try and find the answer, the answer for life and its meaning and its purpose, love and peace and joy. It's all wrapped up in him. He's placed it in your hearts to search, to grope, to find him. Find him. Come to him. Come to this trustworthy God. So you may have, may have noticed, for, for some of you, uh, you have your outline. If you take the first letter of each of the items in your outline, past, uh, it spells out past, praise, awe, strength, trust. So I want this to be used as an acrostic to help you remember this psalm so that so then, you'll look past your circumstances. You'll look past your strength. You'll look past all of the things that tempt you in this world for you to dwell on. You'll look past all of those and look to this awesome God. Look to Him. And from that, righteous ones praise Him. May Southside Bible Church be a place of praise. Of praise because of what God has done and may He be put on display. May He be our everything and not the person that stands in this pulpit or sings the songs, but the God that is preached and the God that is sung to. May it be about all of those so I close with this. Albert Migat wrote of a Canadian pastor friend in a period of great despondency who received the help he needed by reading the following delightful, true incident. The local parks commission had ordered to remove the trees from a certain street, which was to be widened. And as they were about to begin, the foreman and his men noticed a robin's nest in one of the trees and a mother robin sitting on the nest. The foreman ordered the men to leave the tree until later. Returning, they found the nest occupied by little wide-mouthed robins. Again, they left the tree. When they returned at a later date, they found the nest empty. The family had grown and flown away. But something at the bottom of the nest caught the eye of the one, one of the workmen. A soiled little card. When he had separated it from the mud at the sticks, he found that it was a small Sunday school card. And on it, the words, We trust in the Lord our God. Oh, that we would trust in the Lord with our lives, knowing that he cares for us even more than the birds of the air and the flowers of the field. Pray with me. So, Lord, we, we come to you, an all-worthy God, an awesome God, worthy of praise. 
I thank you that we get an eternity, an eternity to praise you. Because that's barely enough time to say thank you. To say thank you for who you are and for what you have done. God, you are so amazing. And I thank you for the text that you have brought before us. I thank you for the work you've, you've done in my heart. I pray that you would do a work in my brothers' and sisters' hearts to know you, to praise you, for you are awesome, and you are strong, and in you we can trust. So Lord, may we do so. And as we turn our hearts towards your table to remember you, may we remember Remember what you've done and praise you for it. It's in your precious son's name that we pray these things. Amen.